Mine is a very personal and often emotional story, but it's actually a really ordinary story too, and one whose threads I think might be shared by some of you here today. Eleven years ago, I was expecting our second much-wanted baby, <laughs> the one we'd imagined in our mind's eye and who'd clung to pregnancy as, sadly, several before her had not. With big sister Mia, we toddled and waddled around, talking about the baby in mummy's tummy, what an amazing big sister she was going to be, and washing and folding tiny clothing in anticipation. We didn't care what the sex of the baby was, as long as it was healthy. And in our naivety, we thought that was all that was important. Scans, expensive multivitamins and a doula on standby had quite literally bought us the peace of mind we thought we needed. Two weeks before her Christmas due date, our youngest decided to make an early appearance. So we calmly put into place our plans for a home birth. Mia went to stay with her beloved godmother, and my husband Bob set about warming our drafty old house. And um, for some reason, covering all the furniture in industrial plastic sheeting. <laughs> I'm not sure what he was expecting, some kind of baby cannon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Warm words of encouragement welcomed our newborn onto a nest of pillows. She was born easily, all at once, but floppy, silent, and blue. There was immediate, tangible sense of panic from the medical professionals in the room. But actually, looking back, I think maybe that was more a sense of urgency, an emergency. My mind shut down completely, while my husband went out into the freezing December lane in his shorts to wait for the ambulance he'd been instructed to call. It wasn't just his breath that froze that morning. Time, too, stood still as he waited for that medical assistance to arrive, not knowing whether his newborn was clinging to life inside the family home. On arrival at the hospital, he carried her proudly in from where she was taken away to the neonatal intensive care unit. He insisted on staying nearby while I was left in a side room to recover with our doula. I very quickly began to realise that I was being avoided. Not completely, midwives were floating through my space, engaging in that kind of jovial small talk and wearing that kind of smile that people wear when they feel sorry for you. Or when they're preparing themselves to tell you some unexpected news. It had to be bad news. As time ticked on, the urgency became greater and I began to desperately ask question after question. Where was my baby? Could I see my husband? What was happening? Was she alive? And after an eternity, which was, I think, close to around five hours, and I had reached panic stage, my husband and I were rejoined in that clinical maternity room, distant and far removed from our baby. A consultant came into the room and nervously and formally uttered the words we'd dared not allow ourselves to contemplate. I've looked at your baby, and I think she has Down syndrome. Our midwife cried. A congenital heart condition was later identified, which was in actual fact the cause of her early fragility. My body, 
shut, my, my brain shut down and my body went into physical shock. But my mind went into overdrive. Had I missed a vital supplement? Was it my age? Or maybe those shell-on prawns that I'd eaten? It had to be my fault. I immediately wondered what the impact would be on Mia. Would her daddy leave us? Would we ever have a family holiday again? Would Natty ever marry or even go to school? My ableist subconscious had completely taken over. I think it's really important to pick apart exactly why I felt that all-consuming fear that day, where this one-size-fits-all stereotype had come from. You see, I think we all have created a tragic myth with a central character called Downs. They're in the medical professionals who tell us they're sorry when they give us a risk factor of our babies having Down syndrome, a condition they like to list as um, a list of medical characteristics which they cheerfully refer to as comorbidities. Then there are we women who, when pregnant, pass the baton of fear from one to the other without any real lived experience whatsoever. Our society tends to either pity, patronize, or punish those with a disability. And our mainstream media refer to Down syndrome as being akin to a cancer to be eradicated. And in my case, I have the distant and slightly unsure memory of my grandmother, Gladys, taking me by the hand at about the age of five and steering me firmly across the road as she saw a young man with Down syndrome and his mother walk towards us, their heads bent in realization of what was happening. He's not quite all there, she whispered to me. You see, words shape our thinking. And the picture portrayed for me was certainly one of no hope, not because of an additional chromosome, but because of a constrictive narrative built up around that. A safety net was immediately thrown around us by those who cared. Not the people who told me that only special people receive special babies. Or that God wouldn't have given me any more than I could handle. Neither those who showed me very quickly that Down syndrome is a condition that absolutely everybody has an opinion about. And you are going to hear their outdated nuggets of misinformation within the first few weeks of your baby's life, whether you want to or not. I can give you countless examples, but these two exemplify the most common themes. Oh, they're so musical and loving, aren't they? I wish I had one. <laughs> I often wonder if that person's ever heard Natty sing now. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> whether she got herself a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> and the comment that really stung the most from a pregnant acquaintance pointing to Natty in her pushchair and proudly announcing to me, I'm having all the tests going, you know, because I wouldn't have time for one of them. No, I digress. The safety net was those mentors, such as parents further along the journey than us, who told us they were there for us that everything would be okay. 
our family, such as my brother in the front row here, who drove through the night with my mom to be with us and to see the new arrival. Friends who pitched up on our doorstep with food to cook us a hearty meal when we didn't feel like eating at all and to celebrate our baby's arrival. The medics who not only made Natty strong and well, but let us know that we were up to the job of being her parents, that we'd got this, usually during late night chats over mugs of milky tea. And of course, our greatest educators of all were Mia and Natty themselves. Natalia Hope, as we decided to call her. These two small girls broke apart the fear and replaced it with oodles of love, fun, pride and acceptance. <clears throat> they had absolutely no idea of the stigma attached to Natty's genetic makeup. The words held no meaning for them. Their bond was immediate. And Mia's only question at two was when her baby sister was coming home so we could bath her together for the first time. And so while I was trying to map out Natty's entire life in her first weeks of being in our world, they were just taking each moment as it came. Together, we've learnt that Down syndrome is just one aspect of what makes Natty the unique individual she is. But for her, it means beauty. As a baby, people would cross the street literally to come and have a closer look at this baby who looked like a china doll. And she grew up and flourished and became the UK's first model with a disability to appear in a national supermarket back to school campaign. She's caring, instinctively so. She has a radar for people that need a bit of natty. Once going up to a lady in a doctor's waiting room, laying her hands on her knees, looking her in the face and saying, it's okay, lady. That lady told me in the car park afterwards that she was going through cancer treatment. Natty is fiercely determined. In fact, her favorite phrase is, I do it by myself. She's had to work harder and a little bit longer to reach those milestones like walking, talking, learning to ride her bike, and this summer, having a go at scuba diving. But what she has shown us this, that when there's an obstacle in her way, she'll just find a way around it. So before she could say, I love you at bedtime, she worked out a little phrase, a signed phrase, which means, you happy me. She's also brutally honest, <laughs> with often hilarious and embarrassing consequences. So a couple of years ago, we took her to meet um, some former colleagues, and she met this lovely lady and said, I love your breasts. <laughs> dress, it's a lovely dress, isn't it, Natty? I love your dress too, it's a great dress. She said dress. No, mummy, I said, I like your breasts. <laughs> There have been challenges, of course. Natty underwent corrective heart surgery at the age of two, the single most terrifying time of our lives. She's a little small for her age, and she needs support when communicating. But what this young lady has shown us is that nothing will stop her from being the very best she can be if given the right opportunities and when the limits in others' minds are lifted. This makes me reassess what it is we value in one another. Why is it that the ability to pass exams with flying colours is so much more prized than the ability to make a room this size erupt with laughter, with a funny face 
and a well-timed, purposeful fart, <laughs> which I'm not going to demonstrate. Surely, in the perfect blend, each should be equally revered and valued. What frightens me most is that I might not have had the privilege of being the mom to such an incredible young lady. Because this might not have been what I chose to sign up for. And I wish that Grandma Gladys had lived to meet her. I know she'd have boasted to all who'd listen about each of her great-grandchildren's achievements. And their photographs would have been proudly displayed on her living room wall. But I know something for certain. I know that Natty would have taught her not to fear those on the other side of the road. Thank you.